The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everyone. Hey, this is Mike Volkoff. Nice to see everybody. Uh, hope you had a nice holiday weekend and the uh, and Passover celebration as well. Um, uh, we're here for uh, DOJ, Raising the Bar on Ethics and Compliance Programs. I uh, tried to put the slide deck, uh, you know, so that people can, um, I uploaded it so that people can download it. Uh, sometimes your firewall settings don't allow you to, to uh, download it. But if uh, you want a copy of the slides, just send me an email. I'll send it to you afterwards, mvolkoff at volkofflaw.com, mvolkoff at volkofflaw.com. Uh, we're in the process of taking all of our webinars and making them eventually available, uh, the recordings of them on YouTube. We're setting up a YouTube channel for that. And uh, we'll let you know about that uh, as well. Anyways, it's great to to see everybody. This got this topic uh, got a lot of turnout, uh, which is good because uh, I consider this sort of a watershed moment in compliance. There's a lot here uh, that's packed into what DOJ did. Uh, way beyond some of the headlines are some other important issues that I think everybody should take. Um, take note of and sort of incorporate and redouble efforts on, um, and we'll go through those. But the changes to the enforcement policy, but more importantly, is the new evaluation of corporate compliance programs. And uh, what I think is an unprecedented push um, to improve and increase uh, compliance and HR coordination in particular. Um, and uh, they uh, tied a lot of issues that we put in the employee conduct type of bucket and tied it to culture. Uh, and then we have, of course, their, uh, their mandate that we come up, every company should have a compliance compensation system or compliance uh, compensation review and process to incorporate within your compensation system uh, compliance issues and compliance looks at incentives and disincentives. And then lastly is sort of data preservation requirements. If you have a BYOD policy, uh, you've got to do a lot of things. And when you hear about that, it's, uh, it's not going to be great. Um, so there's a lot of work to do on all of this. Like I said, it's unprecedented. Uh, again, uh, if you can't download the slides, just shoot me an email at mvolkoff at volkofflaw.com. I'll put that back up here, and I can send you a set of the slides. But this is really um, a really pretty significant action from my standpoint. Uh, and, you know, this is from a new administration, and I think most of this, if not all of it, is going to stick, meaning that no matter what an administration comes in, um, you may see some tweaks here and there, but you're not going to see any uh, major changes to this. Uh, to me, it seems like a pretty bipartisan agenda in terms of what they're uh, pushing for. So we're going to go through um, we're going to go through uh, the, the big changes that have occurred, and you know, just so you, everybody has a reference uh, to uh, to those uh, to the changes and what's occurred. First and most significantly, we had the uh, revisiting the corporate co uh, enforcement policy, um, and uh, DOJ sort of let us know what's going to happen here. What they saw was a 10-year decline in white-collar prosecutions. Now, I think part of that is just the complexity of these cases uh, and the amount of data that's involved with, you know, reviewing texting, emails. Uh, we do a lot of that those types of investigations, and they're pretty intensive and can be costly. Um, but uh, DOJ wants to increase uh, corporate prosecutions of white-collar crimes. They're also focusing on individuals, uh, finding the culpable individuals, and they're uh, out marketing voluntary disclosures. Uh, and that, I think, is because 
uh, companies have been more sophisticated in whether or not to voluntarily disclose uh, misconduct. Uh, companies have found that it may be strategic enough to, you know, find the problem, fix the problem, remediate the problem, document everything you do, and then if it turns out it gets disclosed, then you're in a good shape because you can show the department what you did. Um, but as part of this was the increased expectations as to what an effective ethics and compliance program looks like. And that's what we're here to talk about. One thing on individual accountability, because it permeates sort of what a compliance system, compliance uh, compensation system should look like, is the balance between corporate and individual prosecutions and the rethinking. And this is why I think it's going to stick, because no matter what administration uh, reducing corporate fines and the burden on shareholders and increasing the burden on individuals who are responsible for misconduct uh, is going to be sort of the focus. And so organizations now have to align employee incentives and disincentives, and we'll get into much more, greater detail uh, with regard to that as well. So um, just a review with you, uh, the corporate uh, the corporate incentives, corporate enforcement policy revisions. First off, um, you know this was has now been extended to and a requirement that every division of the Justice Department, including environmental crimes, tax, uh, a, a consumer uh, goods, criminal prosecutions of you know for adulterated uh, products, safety, all of that is now been extended uh, that all of them are mandated to re come up with a leniency program, a voluntary disclosure program, where you get benefits if you voluntarily disclose, you fully cooperate, and you timely and appropriately remediate. Um, there's a presumption of a declination, and you have to pay out any ill-gotten gains, that type of things. But where the uh, where the sort of I think not, I wouldn't put a controversy, but there was some sort of questioning about was the uh, whether or not somebody who's a repeat offender or somebody who falls into one of these aggravating circumstances could in fact earn a declination. And I think the answer uh, today um, is to get at, uh, to provide even more incentives or provide incentives in that circumstance. So even if there's an aggravating circumstances, a company that meets all the voluntarily, very voluntarily uh, disclosure requirements, cooperation and remediation, and I put, uh, made a capital, uh, was up to 75% off still. And if, even if there's no voluntary disclosure, up to 50% off. So they're basically include, they're basically raising the prospect of even greater discounts and the fact that even if you're a recidivist, you can still earn these discounts. Uh, and they point to the ABV case, which was a pretty significant, uh, uh, pretty significant as well. So, that's the the revisions that occurred to the corporate enforcement policy, and that's where we're at right now. And let's talk about what the compliance program expectations are, because this is where I think all of us need to take a refreshed look at our own compliance programs and make sure uh, that we incorporate these new required elements. First, though, your compliance program, when if you're in the crosshairs of the department, dealing with the department, um, you it's your compliance program is evaluated at the time of the offense. In other words, when the misconduct occurred and then when you're seeking a resolution. And that's why companies scramble to fix their programs, meet requirements and uh, uh and include uh, testing of the new system. And that's a requirement now that DOJ is really enforcing. 
Uh, otherwise, they'll put in a compliance monitor. Now, this, if you do the, all the good things that you should do, then that can lead to no charges or even reduced penalties. So they're trying to say, look, this is really important. And the potential, if you don't get through it all, if you don't remediate appropriately, if you haven't remediated and tested your new program at the time of resolution, then it's likely you're going to see an independent compliance monitor. And trust me, you don't want that in that situation. It raises costs, it raises risks, everything. Now, the headlines here in terms of compliance, like I said, is one, we have elements now that are tied to corporate culture. Uh, they sort of came to the culture game a little bit later. I think everybody else was sort of realized the value of that. Uh, and then most importantly, and this is going to be if there's you know, one message I really want folks to walk away from here is you got to sit down with HR. And I've had a range of experiences with HR departments. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute because, uh, you know, I've seen good and I've seen very bad. And I mean very bad. So I don't know what your relationship is like um, in terms of and how you coordinate with HR. But uh, uh, I've seen some really difficult situations. And so we're going to get into what the expectation is between HR and compliance and how it ties into uh, corporate culture and internal investigations and everything like that. We also will get into a little bit more detail on the corporate compliance compensation system. Now, this is separate and apart. They want to see these compliance uh, compensation issues taken into account, incentives for positive behavior disincentives for wrongdoers and those with supervisory obligations. And we have an obligation now to preserve employee communications data, particularly with respect to um, uh, BYOD uh, types of systems. So we're now on the third version of the evaluation of corporate compliance programs, March of 2023. The second version that came out in 2020, we uh, we did a webinar on that, but probably the most important thing that came out of that was uh, the mandate that, that compliance get access to all data across the organization. And that was, uh, I think, partly out of frustration that DOJ was seeing that there were silos in a lot of these companies that were coming in with troublesome behaviors. And uh, they wanted to see HR in particular uh, sharing HR data with compliance. It's usually not the other way around. It's not compliance that's not sharing data with other people. It's usually getting uh, compliances access to data across the organization that they need to do their job. And uh, we happen to be biased in that respect because we work with a lot of compliance departments and officers and legal people. and they will frequently complain to us about the lack of access to data or the failure to be, uh, you know, have a seat at the business table. And so the 2020 revision was the first step in that. And then 2019 uh, was the original when it first came out. So there always has been, but I think we have even more so now, uh, the emphasis on human resource issues because of its importance in tying into a culture of ethics and compliance. And uh, it's not like they want compliance to take over HR issues. No, to the contrary, they sort of carve that out so that HR can do its job. But what they want is HR and compliance to sort of leverage their resources uh, together in terms of promoting the culture of ethics and compliance. And that ties into your internal investigation program, your root cause analysis. And we have a new section. And, uh, you know, it's, I always say lawyers really, uh, it's like a trade guild. We create our own language and we define it and we say we're experts at it, like what's substantial, what's whatever. And now we have a new term, which has been placed, uh, DOJ is pushing, which is called consequence management. And uh, so they replaced the incentives and disciplinary actions section with a new section 
And this is where we see all, and it's section 2.C, about compensation systems and consequence management. And what it ties into is that you got to have a very effective internal investigation program. Uh, you have to have a hotline that's working and you have to track incidents. In other words, uh, incident management we're into, not just hotline reports, but incident management. And we have to track employee reporting and disciplinary data across the organization. And I'll show you the key language on that. And we have to conduct a robust root cause analysis of any type of misconduct. Why did it occur? What controls were implicated? And what do we need to remediate? And then in this new section is a new section on data preservation, which we'll go through uh, as well. So remember the framework for the evaluation there, and, and all of this ties into the third issue, but the three questions that the department asks is, is the corporation's compliance program well-designed? And second, is it being applied in good, earnestly and in good faith? Is it adequately resourced and empowered to function effectively? And in the third area, which is where we're going to be talking about here, does the corporation's compliance program work in practice? And one of the ways it works in practice is with consequence management. So DOJ is definitely frustrated by the lack of cooperation between compliance and HR functions. And what we have seen is that the resistance that HR has had in sharing data which is valuable. And here's, and, the, and here's, let me give you an example. Uh, and I always use this example. So if I'm repeating myself, but uh, for example, uh, we had a company where there were um, complaints coming in about sexual harassment by a manager in, a, in Brazil. And uh, what happened eventually is that sexual harassment claims or concerns were never addressed. And this was a precursor to the behaviors uh, deteriorating in the Brazil uh, part of the operation of the company. And that led to fraud, that led to stealing, that led to trade violations, that led to bribery. And so what the, uh, what the, um, what the department is saying is we want, we want compliance uh, as part of its responsibilities for the culture to have access to this data because we know it's important to this data and visibility into employee engagement, investigations, even if they're HR specific issues, um, because these lead to corporate culture. And we want compliance to be setting uh, a course with regard to disciplinary actions so that we ensure consistency of disciplinary actions. In other words, and that means across the organization, and I'll show you again the language for that. So this is the type of, uh, this is the types of concerns that came up. We had a client, for example, at a well-known company, and I'm not going to obviously mention it, but uh, it took uh, compliance three years to gain access to HR data because HR would not share the data, and the issue had to go all the way up to the CEO to uh, mandate uh, access to compliance of the HR data. And what DOJ is saying, that it just cannot occur anymore. And uh, that's why there is mandate has come out in terms of improving the relationship between uh, HR and uh, compliance. So let's think about the areas. And I, I've written about, you know, how uh, compliance and HR on the blog, I've written about how they should be natural partners. They're natural friends. Their issues overlap in so many significant ways. Uh, with corporate culture, but also, you know, HR may run an annual uh, or biannual survey on, on company and employee engagement, and compliance should obviously have some input on the questions that are included. But, you know, this is something they should be doing together, and compliance should have more of a role in that. 
the uh, the fact that an H- HR issues are important indicators of corporate culture and the example I talked to you about with Brazil, this is something that compliance needs visibility into. I'm not saying that compliance should be running those issues. What I'm saying is they just need to know it's going on so that they can look for other red flags that may be occurring beyond just this HR issue and the impact that this HR issue may have on the company's culture. Because if people start to see that there's misconduct and misconduct isn't addressed, then we see um, deteriorating cultures and, and increases in misconduct rates. So now we're into the compliance has a responsibility now for consequence management. Well, if that's not a mandate, for compliance to be involved in some kind of coordinated activity with HR. I can't think of what else it would be. Disciplinary actions, that we have to be more involved in that. Financial penalties to executives and other senior people who may be responsible, and we'll talk about the definition of that, for misconduct. And we have to stay on top of the trends on reporting data, investigation performance, and disciplinary actions across the organization. Again, remember, this is for across the organization, and that's what uh, we really need to uh, think about. Now, in addition to this, uh, just to make our lives a little more interesting, the criminal division, which is just the part of uh, DOJ that deals with fraud, anti-corruption, deals uh, uh, with um, other issues. I mean, criminal, for example, criminal national security issues like trade sanctions is dealt with by the National Security Division, which is different than the criminal division. But they put in place a three-year pilot program, and the three-year pilot program basically wants and mandates that people put in place some kind of compensation and bonus program. So, for example, a pro, uh, uh, that we need to have a prohibition on business, on bonuses for employees who do not satisfy compliance performance requirements. So uh, we see this, uh, and I would say the most that I see is basically if you don't complete your training, you can't get your bonus that type of thing, but we need to start thinking more broadly about those types of compliance performance requirements. Um, And we need to have disciplinary measures for culpable employees and incentives uh, for employees who demonstrate full commitment to compliance processes and requirements. In other words, bonuses and things like that. So this is, these are sort of the three elements that they said we'd like to see But more importantly is who is a culpable employee? And this is where we get into a broader definition than we otherwise would. So, for example, uh, and what has been laid out is that there's a very broad definition of who's culpable. And this is part of the focus that the department wants with regard to how you do your disciplinary actions. What are your consequence management factors? And it, the employees are beyond, let's say you, you find somebody who's stolen money or paid bribes or whatever, the, that person is obviously culpable. But the more important issue in culpable employees now are those who had supervisory authority over the employee or the business area that was involved in the misconduct and knew of, and this is B in the first bullet there, knew of or were willfully blind to the misconduct. In other words, that they ignored red flags. They didn't follow up in a regular way as required or expected. Uh, And that that had they done so, maybe they would have found this misconduct and basically uh, stopped it. And those culpable employees have to suffer some financial penalty uh, or some disciplinary action of some sort. Uh, obviously, the person who engaged, let's say, in fraud, misconduct, and stole money would be fired. But the question is, what happens to the supervisor who failed to act 
or ignored red flags and and just said, ah, I don't want to deal with this or whatever. It's too much of a hassle. I'm not sure that the guy's stealing or whatever. The question is, we have to have a policy that says those that are willfully blind will be punished as well. Now, if you do that, the incentive, if you put the fact is, if you put that program in place and you recoup, you recoup, let's say clawback, bonuses, some kind of deferred prosecution, deferred uh, compensation program, something, then what happens with the department is they will reduce your penalty. So let's say you own a million dollars, you owe a million dollars for a penalty, but you recovered uh, 200,000, 200,000 from these uh, bad actors. In that case, uh, they would then take the 200,000 off and say, you need to, um, you need to uh, just pay 800,000. Now, Let's say you have a deferred prosecution agreement, and it takes litigation sometimes, depending upon the contracts uh, that you have with your executives, to recoup the money. And let's say you win some and you lose some in terms of what your policies uh, enabled you to do. Um, then, if you're not able to recover the two hundred thousand, but you've sort of made efforts, you're in good faith prosecuting them. Uh, you would then have to pay back some of the money that you don't recover. But if you make a good faith effort, they'll reduce that payback by 25%. Now, look, this seems complicated to me in terms of the ability to recoup bonuses from people or, uh, frankly, the department have, you know, put out some language suggesting that maybe you could put it in escrow accounts but the problem is you've got to pay you got to pay bonuses to people that's what that's how you attract uh, good talent and uh, this could lead to sort of litigation and going back and forth but the department wants to try to give you as much of an incentive to claw back as much as you can to punish these people who engaged in wrongdoing and they're trying to do that by allowing you to take dollar for dollar off of the penalty that you have to pay, let's say at the time that a deferred prosecution agreement uh, comes into existence. It'll be interesting. The program is in effect now. Uh, it's for three years. It's a pilot program. Uh, March of 2023, it started. So uh, by March of 2026, if it works or they like what the results have been, they will then um, uh, you know, make it a final rule. And I would expect it to be, uh, I would expect it to be, you know, implemented across the department. So I know that's kind of complicated, but the main thing here that we have to do is we have to look at our compensation system, our bonus system, and take a look at that, uh, and make sure that we have appropriate clawbacks, um, and these and and when we talk about clawbacks here, I want to underscore to you, this is in addition to just to make your life complicated SEC requirements with regard to clawbacks when you have financial restatements. There's a whole separate area. But that's why the department is calling this a compliance compensation system. They want to see a separate compliance compensation system. Now, I brought up Dan, Dan's bank because that's the first resolution that we had with a clawback or compliance compensation requirement. And this was settled at the, at the end of last year for $2 billion, and this related to AML and sanctions violations and fraud for dealing for uh, Dan's bank's uh, dealings with uh, Estonia clients who were basically a lucrative line of Russian oligarch customers. Uh, and they basically processed uh, $160 billion, but this went through the United States correspondent banks, uh, and therefore the U.S. had jurisdiction. But I want to show you this, which was the actual provision that was included in their deferred prosecution agreement and compliance requirements under the deferred prosecution 
So this applies now an executive compensation requirement, and this is the actual language that applies to executives, senior managers that are not executives are exempt, but evaluation of the executive's actions to ensure business or the department is in compliance. And an executive is ineligible for any bonus if they receive a failing score in compliance. Now, that means that somebody's got to come up with a system to score your compliance performance and obviously to make the requirement clear and uh, to then score the executive on their compliance uh, performance. And this can't be just training, completing training. There's got to be more to it than that. And if they fail, then they would be ineligible for any bonus that year. So you can see the implications of this across the board with regard to the business, with regard to leadership, with regard to your C-suite, with regard to everybody sitting down at the table, legal, HR, compliance, everybody mandating that we work together to come up with a executive compensation type of system. And the penalty broadly applies, and this is perhaps the most important part, to discipline executives for conduct that has contributed, contributed, not caused directly, contributed to compliance failures. And that to me is again the language of its broad application. It includes those in the oversight and uh, functions and those that have contributed for failures to act or for direct actions in terms of compliance failures. So that's why this gets pretty complicated in that sense. So I know that's a lot there, but that's really, you know, one thing I want to make sure uh, um, I want to make sure that we, you know, deal with. Now, I've gotten a lot of questions here in terms of, um, you know, how this applies. Um, uh, anyways, um, you know, uh, the impact of making, um, you know, a failure versus, uh, you know, getting a D or a C. Um, the impact in some countries, there may be limitations on contractually and what we can do um, and uh, fulfill, you know, and, and there may be uh, trade unions that we have to deal with where this could apply to managers in a way. So these are all complicated issues that people are going to have to, uh, you know, be be. Uh, be involved with. The, a good question that we got also was the difference between consequence management and disciplinary actions. Well, there there is that because we're going to talk about that in a second, and that leads into the next question, which is what is consequence management? Well, consequence management applies to all of this, and uh, and I and this is why the the new DOJ standards here. I'm talking about raising the bar. It has absolutely raised the bar because now in the first sentence to me is the most important. There's a mandate to track, evaluate and share data. And the key language, and I could have, should have put quotes around it, is across the levels, geographies, units or departments of an organization. In other words, somebody's got to centralize all of this. Somebody's got to track, evaluate, and make determinations and address particular red flags and issues. And it applies to all of these areas, not just consistent discipline, but notice all the issues that this applies to. It applies to your hotline reporting system. So somebody centralized some organization, some group of people have to be sitting there and evaluating this data across the levels, geographies, units, or departments of an organization. So your hotline reporting system, your, and I would broaden that to include incident management, resulting investigations, resulting investigations. So what investigations have been done? How were they done? What was the rate of substantiation? What was the root cause in those that are substantiated? What's your average time to complete an investigation? 
and how are you applying consistent discipline and then including recoupment of financial bonuses from executives uh, or managers really responsible for misconduct. This is right here is you want to talk about a new area for the department to say to compliance departments, you have to be you have got to have somebody who's in a holistic way looking at all of this and how this ties into and what this does to promote your culture. And that means there's even more to this in a minute. I'm going to show you. But this is where we're going with consequence management. And that's why the change in terminology is so uh, important. The broad mandate of data sharing, when you say across the levels, geographies, units, or departments of a company, um, that means that if I'm sitting centrally and as the head of compliance, I have to know how are we tracking and what are our employee reporting rates and substantiation rates and investigation rates in, uh, take uh, Russia. So now I know uh, I've got to get a holistic view of this, and I need access to all this information, and I've got to sh ensure overall achievement of the mandate on da data sharing and then the consequence management and then the impact that that has on our culture. So talk about a watershed moment, this is a watershed moment. So no longer can we have silos. No longer can we have a division, uh, a part of our company that operates in Asia, separately managing and dealing with all of this, even having it at the Asia level. This has to ultimately come back in some broader way to uh, the higher ups of the of the department, uh, of the uh, compliance uh, program, working closely with regard to HR in all of this. Now, I'm going back and just, and I'm not going to go through this, but the department has previously, and this is still incorporated within the evaluation, but it wasn't changed here. But these are what they have said are the requirements with regard to of reporting and investigations and an efficient and trusted mechanism. But now we have to, to uh, you know, carry out and make sure that as part of this consequence management, that we are on top of the data with regard to the and the occurrence of what's going on with reporting and investigations. And so there's now a lot more responsibility where we may have to, for example, let's say we have an internal investigation function in Asia, we may have to do an audit and to make sure that they're properly scoping their, uh, their investigations. They're accurately assessing them as to seriousness. They're conducting them and properly documenting them and that they used a pro proper and qualified investigator and that they're, you know, they're being done in a timely way. And was there a root cause analysis which led to some kind of change or improvement in controls as required? So this is what I mean in terms of uh, employee reporting and investigations and our hotline and incident data. We now have to revisit this issue again, and we want to make sure that uh, we get as many, as much data as we can get with as much uh, sort of carving it up into types of reports and incidents uh, and analyze this across the, the company globally, uh, if you're a global company, with regard to hotline and incident data. The disciplinary process we've talked about, and it has to be consistent. So, for example, we ended my solution, and I've always recommended this to, to people, and I've seen it work very well, is to create some kind of disciplinary committee uh, with representatives from compliance, HR, legal, business, security, management, whatever you want, uh, who are involved, and finance uh, should be on that list as well, is uh, to have some independent objective review of discipline across the organization. And this is now more important than ever uh, to have such a committee and to have, make sure that 
that we're not running into situations where similarly situated employees or executives are being punished in a different way. Um, and it's really important. Um, um, the, it's really important that investigations and discipline are sort of carried out in a consistent way. And uh, so there's more importance to, you know, setting up a system like this and making sure that we don't run into a situation with uneven disciplinary actions. But now this process has to include clawbacks and financial penalties that may occur with regard to this. Uh, and so this, again, that key language is there across the levels, geographies, units or departments of an, ex of an organization. And employee concerns and internal investigations here is, uh, and this is, again, just emphasizing incident tracking, internal investigations, root cause analysis, and use of information to update your compliance program your, and your risk assessment, and to go on and figure out what impact this has on the overall organization's uh, risk profile. And that's got to be part of this sort of risk assessment employee concern loop. So now let's talk about compliance compensation systems. And here we get into uh, a little bit more of the incentives and disincentives that come up. But remember that it's not just about punishment. It's also rewarding those, rewarding compliance and people uh, and penalizing individuals who engage in misconduct. And DOJ has made it clear that they're going to review not just what is in on paper, uh, but they're going to review what actually happened in practice. In other words, show us the data, show us the situations where you uh, imposed clawbacks or show us the situations where you rewarded compliance and why you rewarded uh, somebody for their compliance performance either with a bonus or with an award, anything like that that can come up. So let's start on the positive side. I always like to be a positive person. So we'd start on the positive side and we want to promote compliance. So and can we use some compliance metrics and benchmarks in compensation calculations? Now, one of the things I've seen, obviously, is, you know, do we have ethics week? We have uh, many companies that give out ethics awards on a monthly basis, and the person gets an award. They get a photo with the CEO. They're included in, in internal publication. And uh, there's usually a story about what they did to earn this award. I think that's uh, terrific. We also have performance reviews that include compliance as, let's say, 10% of your overall evaluation. But I want to think creatively and go beyond those sort of standard um, uh, awards type of things and think about what kind of compliance metrics we could come up where people could earn bonuses, a spot bonus, or where they could provide incentives to include, let's say, a portion of any raise that you get would be dependent upon or uh, reflective of your compliance behavior. Uh, in other words, what a compliance activities you've engaged in, what uh, time you've spent. Let's say somebody serves as an ethics champion or an ambassador. Uh, you know, they're a business person, but they also serve part time as an ethics and compliance person. We should include some type of positive reward financially, hopefully, for that person, because then we're providing a positive incentive for them to promote compliance as an ethics or compliance ambassador. And this is a creative way that I've loved that compliance has done up to now uh, this kind of uh, reward system. Another issue of just monumental importance uh, is this, because in the language of the evaluation is that they want compliance with a seat at the table to, to evaluate the impact of sales targets and other similar programs on employee compliance. Uh, and so think about the Wells Fargo debacle. What they're saying is if compliance had a seat at the table when they put in the 
uh, incentive program that led to so many people to just, I mean, almost brought Wells Fargo down, as I call them, the, you know, they are just the worst example of corporate culture that imagine if compliance was sitting there and said, look, if you impose this this uh, incentive program or mandate this program where for each customer you need to get eight other accounts opened up or sell them eight products to meet your requirement that's going to that's going to cause people to engage in unethical behavior it's just i mean compliance if they had sat there would have said this is going to be crazy and this is what they want to happen. They want compliance to be saying, what are the incentives? If we give out large bonuses for a big contract and the big, con- and there's a deadline for that, uh, you know, by the end of the month, then that salesperson may have an incentive to engage in bribery, large contingent payouts and the ins- impact it's going to have on adherence to ethical requirements. Um, so these are the types of things where compliance has to sit at the C-suite, with the business people, with HR, and say, look, when you put in these types of, let's in, imagine the incentives you're creating by this uh, sales uh, program. So, uh, and then we have the penalizing misconduct, which we've talked about, which is holding individuals accountable who engage in misconduct or contribute to misconduct. And uh, we have to have retroactive discipline, meaning that clawback measures, partial escrowing of compensation or equivalent arrangements, there has to be something in place. It has to be written out. It has to be called a compliance compensation clawback of some sort because we want the message out there that if you engage in a, in a violation, this is what's going to happen. And we now have transparency requirement, which is included in the evaluation now, in the design and implementation of the disciplinary process. So we've seen many companies as part of their sustainability reports will put out, we uh, we have a hotline, we have misconduct, we have prosecuted the misconduct, we fired seven people. Um, and there's always that balance between what can we do in terms of disclosing and promoting to advance the fact that there are consequences to misbehavior within our organization? And uh, so we have to have transparency with regard to our disciplinary actions, our incentive structures, and what we're doing to make sure to send the message within the company. We have organizational justice here. People are going to be held accountable including the percentage of senior executive compensation that's tied to promoting ethical conduct. So, for example, if we're under the dance system, as it was written out, what percentage of the compensation is tied to promoting ethical conduct? And we have to make a calculation like that, and we have to promote it as a a requirement and show transparency with regard to it. Senior executive bonuses are, you know, tied 10% to compliance performance. So these are all of the new sort of uh, requirements. Now, I'm not going to go through this, but what I'm trying to do here is to list now all the factors that go into uh, the evaluation of compensation and consequence management. And that's why I'm saying All of these, it's a much broader concept than disciplinary process. It also includes uh, a lot more in terms of down to commercial targets and incentives. The role of compliance is now changed, in my view, is there must be a seat at the uh, C-suite table. And the percentage of senior executive compensation and the hotline reporting system or incident management reflecting the company's culture with all of these uh, factors to be assessed and tracked and monitored with uh, across the organization. So the last issue we get into is, and it's included in this section of the evaluation of corporate compliance, is uh, personal devices, third-party applications, and data preservation. Look, we know that everybody in Europe uses WhatsApp. 
And uh, the department has been frustrated by the fact that we sometimes companies are not able to gain access to that in terms of a internal investigation and trying to capture and investigate misconduct and proof, uh, which and look, the only way you get the WhatsApp data is to actually take the person's phone and download it off of uh, their phone. Sometimes they uh, inadvertently will back it up on their computers, uh, but that also depends upon what access they're allowed on their computer system. Uh, you, you know, in terms of uh, their use of uh, other applications outside the system, the company's systems. So this is employed data on smartphones in particular, tablets, uh, even laptops uh, and other devices. And DOJ wants companies to monitor and access and collect such data. And there's also been use of uh, Signal, uh, other third-party applications which are encrypted uh, in on phones that may be personal but used for business purposes. So out of frustration, and this is, raises some really significant issues, what the first thing the department wants us all to do is to identify the communications channels that are available for use by the business and which channels have been authorized. Now, if you're going to authorize WhatsApp, if you're going to say it's okay to use WhatsApp on your BYOD, let's say your personal phone, and you can use it for business purposes, the department is now going to require you to collect that data and store it. In other words, people have to come in, give you their phone, you'll have to download it and store all of that data somewhere if it's an authorized channel. For each uh, and for each channel, okay. So, for example, you can have uh, Jabber or inter Slack or internal communication systems, and they're going to want to know. You have to evaluate that. How's it used? What is it authorized for? And they have to document how they manage and preserve that information on that channel. So you can't just take the Slack data every year and destroy it. They want to know how it's preserved and what are your preserver, pre, preservation settings. If you're only keeping it for 30 days, you're going to have a hard time justifying that to the department. Uh, what I would normally do is just like with regard to your document retention policy, usually it's five years. That's also consistent with the statute of limitations, except in False Claims Act cases. But preservation or deleted deletion settings have to be, uh, you know, adopted, implemented, and what's the basis for each applicable setting. So you can't say, oh, bring in your phone, uh, we'll download your signal uh, messages, you'll have to give us the encryption key, uh, and then we're going to keep it for 30 days. No, you've got to come with come up with something better, and you've got to look at all of your communications channels that the business uses, including those that uh, are not run in third-party applications like we've mentioned. All of your policies and procedures now have to be updated, and I've run into too many companies that authorize BYOD but with nothing about um, data preservation, access to data. Now, this is going to, again, raise issues with regard to GDPR and other things like that, but uh, that's something that the department expects you to sort of navigate and work your way through. But all the policies and procedures have, that apply and that they have to include preservation of communications data. And a BYOD program uh, has to be fully documented policies and procedures applicable to that. And like I said, where the company may need to require employees to transfer the data to company record keeping systems, that has to be included. So if you're going to allow third party use, third party applicate use of third party applications for this purpose, uh, for business purposes, you're going to have to include some transfer of data requirement in your policies and procedures such that the company retains the data that's used for business purposes. Now, 
that raises a whole host of issues when you have, let's say, I'm using my WhatsApp for personal and business purposes. Well, then we're going to have to get into which contacts, which communications are business related. So what they want to see is some structure here around this because they don't want to hear about how we don't have access to uh, certain data. And any exception to this policy has to be documented and explained uh, as to why there's an exception and why we, uh, why we did that. The last issue that they, you'll have to uh, deal with with regard to uh, data preservation is there has to be a risk management sort of analysis. In other words, a risk profile, given your company's business communications needs, and the impact that if somebody uh, didn't comply on your ability to conduct a thorough investigation of potential misconduct. And there have to be consequences to executives and employee who violate the policies and procedures. And there has to be discipline uh, for those who fail and employees consistently, again, going back to our consistent discipline concept, uh, for purposes of uh, determining ultimately the risk here is your ability to conduct a thorough investigation of potential misconduct. And the, and the fact that they don't want to hear that, well, we didn't have access to this, so we couldn't determine this. That is not going to be an appropriate answer. In other words, we have to start from the beginning process of saying, okay, what are our company's business communications needs and practices? What are the risks that we have with regard to access to data? And what are we going to do then to preserve that data so that we can run internal investigations? And then if, for example, our policies and procedures don't address this in a fulsome way, then we're going to have to adjust our policies and procedures. And then what is the risk of noncompliance? Well, if you've got a bad actor there and they know that this is going to be preserved, who knows? They may say, well, I'll find another third party application and they use an unauthorized communications channel. Um, but at least what they want clear is here's what you're expected to do. And that person then could be disciplined for violating the requirements and the policies and procedures. So it's kind of what I've seen and what we've seen is sort of haphazard with regard to this issue and haphazard uh, in terms of people really uh, addressing this. So let's take a moment. We have a few, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions and I apologize uh, uh, for not sort of addressing this. Uh, do you have guidance on how to perform a root cause analysis? Well, that is really a great question because the difficulty with root cause analysis is that it, we should always do it and attempt to do it, is that you can have various contributing factors. There's Sometimes there's a very clear answer to the root cause, but and we need to document this process and what we do going forward. And uh, we need to make sure that we can uh, address those with regard to those direct contributing factors and those or direct factors and those contributing factors. So it's important to do that um, in terms of performing uh, root cause analysis and with regard to every investigation or serious investigation that has to be done. On executive compensation, will they get a partial bonus if they get a mediocre score like a D or a C? Well, in the that's an interesting question, and I imagine you could do something like that because the um, uh, the dance case wanted to make sure that if you failed, you didn't get access to any bonus, and uh, that begs the question as to well, okay, that's a great question. What if you get a, a D or a C, an average score, and can you penalize them? And my thinking would be, yes, you could, uh, uh, you know, barring some local or, you know, other legal requirement with regard to that. Um, here's a great question. If we make individuals responsible, especially with clawbacks, how can the supervisor who raised the red flag be protected against endemic dismissal for meeting compliance objectives and deadlines? Well, 
you know, the greatest protection I always say is to document. And I would urge the supervisor who raised the red flag, uh, you know, to be protected in that sense and say, look, um, I raised this red flag, nothing happened with it. I raised it again, nothing happened with it. And just put uh, contemporaneous documentation there is the key issue. But that's a great question because what if the supervisor who's going to be punished uh, had raised the issue and then says, well, wait, you guys should be asking my boss as to why he or she did not do anything uh, about that. So that's, uh, that's great. Uh, another question came in in some countries in Europe. The general attitude is that no one should receive an award for doing their job properly, fulfilling all compliance requirements. Incentives are not seen as something of value for an organization. Could you share the DOJ's and your stand on this point? How important is it to have incentives programs in place and implementing it? Well, I think it's very, it's absolutely important, but I get your point. I think European-based companies that are global and have U.S. operations uh, it's hard for the U.S. culture or the U.S. mandates to change sort of what Europe might do in that uh, instance. But uh, what I would do is try to do as much as you can in terms of positive re rewards. Um, but I get it that many organizations just say, hey, you shouldn't be rewarded for doing what you should be doing anyway. So I get that point. That's a good uh, point. Uh, let me do one last thing before we uh, before we take off here, and that is uh, to ask you uh, to um, you know our standing uh, poll question, and I'll do that real quick. Uh, if you want any help in this area, we're we're definitely around. We're here to help you, support you, uh, and uh, and to do as much as we can to. Um, I mean, these are new requirements, and I think they're pretty serious. Uh, and I do think this is a watershed moment. And I think it requires all of us to sort of go go to management and leadership and say, look, we've got to address this. You've got to have, and you know, I, I push this all the time because I love compliance and I love, I'm passionate about the importance of it, is that you've got to have that seat at the C-suite now. You can't rely upon the general counsel if you report to the general counsel to do this for you. This is something that requires compliance to have its own sort of, it goes back to the independence, the authority, everything that uh, the department uh, expects of compliance as uh, a separate entity with uh, independence and authority uh, and, and resources, of course. So, uh, I'm trying to give you sort of a pep talk that, uh, you know, to navigate this issue carefully, but to, you know, use the department's language as, you know, this is something, as uh, I often say, is board worthy. The board needs to know about this. Everybody needs to know about this uh, and the CEO as well. Um, let's. Uh, um, and if you could. Don't forget, if you do need a copy of the slides, just send me an email and uh, and we'll go from there and uh, I'll send you a set of the slides. Um, there's a lot of material in there. I'd urge you to read the evaluation as well uh, when you get a chance. OK, thanks, everybody. Keep up the great work. And uh, and like I said, uh, keep up the great work and get this in front of the leadership and your board and Hopefully we can we can make some progress here. Thanks again.